Citizens of Earth, how the hell are ya? On here? Getting ready to creep into 2013 on a wing and a prayer? A little battered, a little bruised, but still standing. I am in much better condition than I was at the time of my last upload, and despite a few stumbling blocks, I did manage to have a pretty damn solid December ween. I hope you did too. So, let's go ahead and get this last bit of Q&A out of the way, so we can kick off the new year with no regrets. Hell, maybe not too far into the new year, I'll even manage to get another game started. Remember when I actually finished and then started new games? Ah, it was long ago and it was far away. Oh god, it seems so very far. But if life is just a highway, then the soul is just a car. And it's time for our first question. This one comes to us courtesy of Steve Asat 2. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anyway, Steve says, I just finished VVV VVV, which is a clever but frustrating platformer suffering from way too much butterfoot physics. Two questions. One, have you ever been tempted to do any Flash games? I actually didn't know 6V was developed in Flash, but I just looked it up, and as a matter of fact, it was. Hmm. I have been educated today. Anyway, honestly, I haven't. Uh, I really can't think of too many Flash games that uh, have been more than a passing distraction for me, just something to pick up, play with for a few minutes, and then go on about my day. Uh, I'm really actually kind of surprised to hear that uh, VVV VVV is a uh, game developed in Flash, because even in its first incarnation before it was ported out of Flash, uh, it was quite a bit more polished than you usually see in Flash games, and it didn't have that sort of Flash look about it. You know, the, the way that a lot of things developed in Flash have these certain uh, visual characteristics in common. Anyway, uh, no can't say as I have, honestly. And, uh, question two. What's the worst game you've played in terms of a character who just can't stick his landings and consequently racks up deaths in the triple digits? Well, I can't think of any single game that was quite that bad off the top of my head. I'm sure I've played a few, but they're not coming to me at the moment. They're probably not, uh, all that significant in my, uh, broad expanse of gaming memories. However, I will say this, there really needs to be some sort of hard ban on any kind of jumping sequence, any sort of platforming sequence in a game that is just not developed to handle them, like an engine that is just not at all suited to such things. A uh, couple examples that come to mind are uh, the first two Double Dragon games for the NES and uh, the arcade version of Growl. Now, I know in your beat-em-ups, your brawlers, environmental hazards are a part of the genre, and I think a valuable one. I have no problem with that. Um, perfectly fine to have your environmental hazards, uh, especially to uh, throw enemies into, and uh, it's perfectly fine to have an obvious chasm that you have to jump over every now and then, and of course you can also throw enemies into that, and that's great. But actual platforming of any degree of sophistication just should not be in a beat-em-up. Unless you somehow have amazing jumping controls, which I've never played a game like that that had amazing jumping controls. Um, yeah, like some of the cave sequences in Double Dragon, uh, the trap room, and the place with the illusionary floors in Double Dragon 2, uh, the cave platforming again in Growl, uh, I don't know what it is with these games in caves, uh, and of course there was uh, Zen in the original Half-Life. I thought Zen was a really cool environment, but I can't think of too many first-person games at all that should have platforming in them. It just doesn't tend to work. I mean, I know there have been a few exceptions, but unless you know you're exceptional, don't ex don't assume you're one of those exceptions. But yeah, other than that, games that are actually built around jumping, uh... Let's see, there was the Ninja Gaiden series on the NES, and uh, some of the Sonic games, and so on. Uh, there have been lots of pit-related deaths, uh, some of the Castlevanias as well. 
but usually that's a matter of enemy placement and the fact that there's a lot of knockback that sends you into pits. There really isn't a problem with the jumping per se, even in Castlevania. Uh, you know, your jumps aren't controllable, but they're consistent, and you land solidly, you don't slide around or anything like that. So, examples that are really specific to what you asked, I'm afraid I'm at a bit of a loss thus far, but I hope it's been an interesting bit of discussion all the same, and thank you, Steve, for your question. Moving onward, we're gonna hit a trifecta from someone else with a surname I'm not sure how to pronounce. So I do apologize profusely if I should mangle this one. These are from Pat Mielk. I hope that's reasonably close, and again, apologies if I'm pronouncing that completely wrong. Anyway, Pat first asks, Have you ever been into D&D or other tabletop RPGs? And if so, have you ever been the Dungeon Master and or created your own game world? If so, it'd be great to hear about said world. Well, I did play quite a lot of AD&D 2nd Edition in junior high and a little bit in high school. Uh, junior high was definitely the peak of my activities in that category. And every now and then, when some of my old friends from that era of my life are back in town, uh, we'll get together and throw together a, a quickie 2nd uh, Edition game. Mostly 2nd Ed. We've dabbled a little bit in 3rd Edition and uh, kind of very perfunctory stabs at 4th Ed. But really, 2nd Edition was what we grew up on, and so when we get together, that's what we tend to go back to. I also played a little bit of uh, Cyberpunk 2020 in uh, mostly, again, junior high and a little bit in high school. And I, I like that system quite a bit. Uh, the source books were always really cool. Uh, a lot of flavor, interestingly written. Uh, I think uh, Night City from Cyberpunk 2020 is probably my favorite source book of all time. If you can find a cheap copy, uh, even if you don't play the game, I would definitely recommend reading it just for the flavor. It's a really cool kind of you know, dark cyberpunk version of Gotham City, grim kind of urban hellscape. And I like shit like that, especially when it's uh, well realized, which I think Night City is for the most part. Uh, as for DMing, I did a bit of it, but I was never actually very good at it, and I never really built up my worlds too much. They were just something to hang an adventure on, didn't do much of the, you know, sophisticated world building or realization. So I'm afraid I don't have much uh, worth recounting on that front. However, uh, this, uh, going down this bit of memory lane does uh, bring to mind a uh, friend that uh, we used to game with when I was in junior high and high school once again uh, by the name of John. And John uh, was and remains a hell of a character and every now and then he would DM despite not really putting any thought into it beforehand. He was just kind of making up his adventures on the fly. And uh, I can't remember if he was drunk or baked at the time, uh, neither of which would be out of character for John, but again, he was definitely a character, so even cold sober I could see him doing such a thing. Uh, he was running an adventure based on a map that he had uh, taken from either a Forgotten Realms book or uh, possibly an adventure module, I don't recall for sure, but uh, there was a naval battle scenario that he had come up with that could have been pretty cool, but uh, he started to have some problems organizing the thing, and one of the players ha uh, asked to have a look at the map, and it turned out that uh, John had interpreted as the ocean what was actually marked on the map as a forest, so he had to kind of scramble to figure out what to do now that he had basically put a fleet of galleons uh, up in the trees. And there was another adventure John ran that I'm fairly certain he was drunk and or baked for, in which uh, the objective we found out along the way was to find the golden toothpick so we could turn on a TV and go through the TV back to our home dimension or something like that. So. 
Yeah, John's adventures were always uh, something of a trip, if not uh, actually good in any sort of objective tabletop gaming sense. But yeah, I did uh, spend a lot of time again with uh, AD&D 2nd Edition, a smaller amount of time with Cyberpunk 2020, and uh, that's pretty much that. Second question from Pat is, I know that you get a lot of requests for specific games to be played, but I was wondering generally if there are any other C64, Candy, Amiga, or Apple era games that you might like to iPad in the future. My favorite I play to things are definitely ACS Rivers of Light and Below the Root. Well, I'm glad that you've enjoyed those. I am a big fan of Below the Root. Uh, for historical reasons and for being a very well-made game for its time. Uh, let me think. Yeah, there are definitely a few that I wouldn't mind doing. I really enjoyed, uh, on the Apple II, Wavy Navy back in the day. Very simple, uh, single-screen shooter, but a lot of fun. I could possibly do a sort of fun-sized single segment I played a thing on that. Uh, there was Captain Goodnight and the Islands of Fear. That was a big favorite of mine in the Apple days. And the only problem with that one is I have finished it in the past, but it is a very difficult game and I'm not sure I can still actually get all the way through it. Uh, what else? The other game using the, the same or similar engine as Below the Root, uh, Alice in Wonderland from Wyndham Classics, that would be worth examining. Uh, those are the only ones I can really think of off the top of my head, but if I went through a listing of you know, historically notable or major Apple and C64 games, I'm sure I would run across a few more. Uh, the Apple II was the first platform that I think I spent a really large amount of time gaming on, even though it wasn't a particularly good platform for that, especially with the uh, shitty onboard sound capabilities. But, yeah, I could definitely see myself doing some more C64 and Apple stuff in the future. Uh, I just don't have specifics off the top of my head. And for number three, we've got a very easy one. Are you a musician? If so, what do you play? And do you have any other creative outlets besides I played a thing? Well, uh, again, that's a very simple one because, no, I am not a musician and I don't play anything. I took some piano lessons as a kid, but that didn't pan out too well, large be l ah, largely because I am a very lazy creature and didn't practice nearly as much as I should. And also, even if I had kept in practice, I think it would have been kind of a lost cause because I am very tenured. I mean, I know when I like a piece of music, but I'm really fairly tone deaf when it comes to... Uh, you know, the important subtleties. Eh, it's just a lost cause. Other creative outlets, uh, well, I occasionally do a bit of writing, but again, being a very lazy creature and having too many hobbies uh, for the amount of spare time I have, I really don't do a lot of writing, and when I do, I rarely finish anything, and not much of it is anything that I think is of a quality that should be unleashed into the world. So, I hate to say it, but I'm much more of a passive entertainment kind of guy, or at least an interactive entertainment guy in the sense of uh, video games, than I am the kind of guy who creates his own fun. But, you know, maybe one of these days I'll be struck with inspiration and become the next J.K. Rowling or what have you, and, uh, you know, the Pope might convert to Judaism, uh, various other things could happen, but I wouldn't say it's the way to bet. In any case, I've really gone on quite a ramble there. Thank you for enduring my ramble, and Pat, thank you for submitting your questions. Coming up next, we have a fresh round of questions from Mayo the Hedgefox. Or is it Mio? Here I am again having trouble with name pronunciation today, uh, so if it's Mio or some other less obvious uh, pronunciation, I once again extend my apologies, but we're going to go with Mayo. Uh, and Mayo would like to know some things about the technical side of my videos. 
First up, what did you use to assemble co-op We Play to Things like Trampoline Terror? Well, the older ones were generally done uh, when Boss Goji and I were under the same roof, and so we just shared a mic. But for Trampoline Terror and some of my guest appearances on things like uh, GTF South and Felgana, we did them over Skype using uh, sometimes Audacity for the audio recording and sometimes Pamela, which is an app that works with Skype to record Skype calls. By the way, I'm not entirely satisfied with Pamela, so if anyone has any recommendations on good and reasonably idiot-proof ways to record from Skype, I am definitely interested in your recommendations. So that's uh, really how those were accomplished, nothing too complicated about it. And next, Maya would like to know, what video editor do I use? I think I covered this in a previous Q&A session. I don't remember for sure, but just in case, I'll wrap it up quickly. Uh, I use Camtasia for my video editing, because I am not very knowledgeable about video editing. And Camtasia has a reasonably good selection of features and uh, multiple timelines and things like that, while being easy for ignorant people like me to actually get anything done with. I've played around with Sony Vegas and Adobe Premiere, and I could not make heads or tails of them. So uh, that's how that works. If I have any raw videos that I need to re-encode after the fact, I usually just use MediaCoder. And what microphone do I use? Well, up until just now, I was using a Logitech stick mic, a fairly cheap and cheerful thing that... Uh, well, I can't badmouth it too much because it was a faithful servant for five years and got me to where I am now. But, as I'm sure you've all noticed, the audio quality was never all that good. I'm not sure what model it is, by the way, offhand. I'm looking at it right now and there's no model number or name written on it. But it was just a low-end Logitech stick mic. Uh, for December Ween, from my sister and her husband, I actually received a new mic, which I am using right now, and I think you'll find that uh, the recording quality is quite a bit less hissy and farty and generally noisy. And that is a Blue Microphones Snowball. Yes, I am using a USB Blue Snowball. This particular model of mic came recommended by my bosom chum and digital audio expert Justin, and I thank you very much, Justin, for that recommendation, because it's working out very well so far. A definite improvement from my old Logitech mic. And it also occurs to me that using a blue snowball sounds like some sort of drug slang, or possibly terminology for some sort of bizarre sexual act. But we'll try not to think too hard about that, and I will just thank Mayo for the questions. Thank you, Mayo. Another pair of questions comes to us courtesy of Shadow Spear 9. And Shadow Spear's first question is, what was your first video game memory? Well, this one is really going to show my age because the honest answer is Pong. Yes, when I was just a sprout, back at the first house I ever lived in, we uh, had a TV in the basement to which was connected a dedicated Pong console manufactured, I believe, by Radio Shack. So, uh, yeah. Just barely, but I am just barely old enough to remember uh, home Pong machines when they were actually a going concern rather than museum pieces. The Atari 2600 was uh, released in 1977 and I was born in 1978, so... The Atari 2600 was out by the time I came along, but I didn't actually get to play one until a few years later in life than I had uh, played the Pong machine. So yeah, my first video game memory was uh, whacking a little pixel ball back and forth between a couple of lines using uh, Radio Shack paddle controllers. Yep, I feel ancient. Anyway. Second question from Shadow Spear is, what drew you to obscure games? Was it one particular game, or is it, like me, because you like seeing unique and interesting game mechanics and narratives? Well, the latter is definitely more the case. Uh, 
I like games that have a unique style about them. Even if the mechanics aren't all that unique, I just like uh, something distinctive about the visual style or about the uh, character design, something like that. And uh, I guess I just like knowing about a breadth of games. You know, anyone can talk about uh, the Mario games or Final Fantasy or whatever, but being familiar with things that are a little off the beaten path, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's something I'm proud of, but it's something I enjoy. Uh, just kind of being a, a repository of trivia on that sort of thing. I think the, uh, the responsibility for it is largely due to a video store that was open near my old house. Uh, Video Spotlight was the name of it. Yeah, Video Spotlight was the first shop in my area to actually rent out games. They initially uh, rented out NES games and later uh, started building up a Genesis library when that system came out. And their inventory was really kind of scattershot. They seemed to buy games for the systems more or less at random. And so they got a lot of weird shit. And back in that day, I rented everything. I think pretty much every game in Video Spotlight's inventory ended up going out to me at least once, because I just wanted to play everything that came out that I could possibly get my hands on, and that was the cheapest way of doing it. So, yeah, just having a very eclectic rental selection in my area, and, you know, just wanting to try everything that they got, went... Uh, went a long way toward me being the obscure game enthusiast that I am today. So, uh, Video Spotlight is long gone, but uh, I owe them a great debt, and uh, that's pretty much that. Thank you, Shadow Spear, for your questions. We got a couple more rolling down the hill at us from Crunchy Nougat 81 Damn, I'm hungry. I skipped lunch today, and at the time of this recording, it's still a couple of hours from when I was planning on getting dinner, so I could really kind of go for some crunchy nougat just to tide me over a little longer. But that's not really important. What's important for the moment is that this crunchy nougat, designation 81, would like to know what are your favorite video games from a visual standpoint? Art style, character design, backgrounds, and so on. Well, I have to give the obvious answer, which is Okami. Pretty much any time you're talking about art style and general prettiness in video games, Okami's gotta come up, but it is for good reason. It is a gorgeous game, and uh, a very good game as well. You know, somewhat Zelda-like, but honestly I found it more enjoyable than most of the recent Zelda games. Uh, if you have not played Okami, there are uh, there's an HD version on PSN now, and I think also on XBL, although I'm not positive about the latter. Uh, mostly on my PS3 these days, so I'm not entirely up on what's on Xbox Live. But anyway, a very good way to experience the game if you haven't. I would definitely recommend it. On a somewhat similar note, uh, the similarity being something highly stylized and pulling it off very well, uh, Killer7 definitely comes to mind. I would not say Killer7 is quite as good a game mechanically, but it does have its charms, and uh, it's probably very cheap at this point. So yeah, Okami and Killer7 definitely come to mind. There's also a special place in my heart for the original Jet Set Radio, which was the first game to really get cell shading right in my memory. There may have been something else, but that's the first one I can remember that really did a good job with the whole cell shading look. Uh, that also has its HD remake on the various online services. I think there's also a PC version of that. Uh, on a less stylized level, I remember being really floored by Final Fantasy X when it came out. Things like the Jose Temple and the Calm Lands were really quite breathtaking to me. I'm not sure how well they've held up because I haven't played uh, FF10 in quite a few years. I should really get around to doing that. It's uh, a game I would definitely not mind replaying for the third time. I've done it twice before. Uh, and in recent memory, there have been the Souls games. Demon Souls and Dark Souls. Also not very stylized, but uh, you know, very breathtaking at times. 
Uh, Dark Souls in particular, you've got things like looking out over Ash Lake, or when you get your first look at An Orlando. And in Demon Souls, you had uh, the Valley of Defilement, which I think is the best realization of a grimy, wet, filthy environment that just kind of grosses you out just to look at it. I mean, Dark Souls had Blight Town, and Blight Town is definitely a nasty piece of work, but the Valley of Defilement really kind of made my skin crawl just for how dirty and decayed everything looked. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know who the artists at uh, From Software are who worked on the Souls games. You know, I'm not real familiar with their names or anything. But I gotta say, they pull off some Peter Jackson sh uh, shit. Um, there are certain uh, views of Boletaria Castle and Demon Souls as well that I think were uh, pretty amazing. So, the Souls series, I think, uh, for non-stylized, sort of a more realized art style. Pretty amazing stuff. There are others that I'm sure I'm neglecting to mention at this point, but those are the ones that are coming to mind right now. And another question from CrunchyNougat81 is, uh, any favorite characters from a video game? Which ones can you relate to or have had the biggest impact? Now that is a somewhat tougher one. Now, I know there were some characters that left a uh, mark on me in the 8 and 16-bit days and so on, but my memories of those times are not always as clear and vivid as I would like them to be, so just so I'm not sitting around all day trying to dredge up uh, which characters were a big deal to me in the Genesis days or what have you, I'm just going to stick to a few examples from the recent generations. And since I was just talking about the Souls series, I'm uh, going to take a look at Dark Souls, in which we have Siegmeier and Laurentius, neither of which is a really major character. I mean, you could technically go through the entire game without ever even speaking to either of them. But uh, it really impresses on me how decent and human they are, despite being undead and not technically human anymore. And in a world as dark and fallen and incredibly hostile as Lord Ran, they're just like little lights just kind of shining out in all that blackness. And I think it's an interesting contrast, and it shows that hope can spring even in the grimmest of circumstances. Like, Laurentius is such an incredibly nice dude. Uh, Laurentius needs all the hugs. You know, he's kind of self-conscious about his pyromancy, uh, wants to make sure that you don't think his magics are unsavory when you talk to him, and, uh, you know, talks about, uh, what a, what an important thing it is for him to give you some of his pyromancy flame, so please take care of it. Uh... And, like, even if you attack him and make him hostile and have to fight him, uh, he seems so upset about it. He's like, no, you were my friend! Why are you doing this? So, yeah, Swamp Bro gets all the hugs. And, uh, Siegmeier? Oh, Siggy. You know, I'm not going to, uh, spoil what happens with Siegmeier, just in case there are people working their way through Dark Souls and, uh, following his side quest and what have you, but, uh, Siegmeier is, is such a lovable dude, just like, uh, Laurentius, and he deserves a much better deal than he gets. Uh, let's see. In the Metal Gear and Yakuza series, we've got, uh, Solid Snake and Kazuma Kiryu. And, uh, you know, call me a Pollyanna, but I like the good guys. I really like the good guys. Uh, as far as superheroes go, I'm, I'm big on Superman and Captain America. Uh, you know, just kind of the Boy Scouts of the whole uh, format. And, uh, Solid Snake and uh, Kiryu are the kinds of badass characters that I can get behind because they're very human and very kind of noble. You know, they will definitely fuck you up, and they've seen a lot of shit, but they haven't lost their humanity through it. They have, uh, you know, they're very, uh, 
I suppose, uh, altruistic sides, and uh, they're compassionate when it calls for it, and characters like that more than, uh, you know, your generic oatmeal-faced uh, bald space marines or your Kratos-type sociopaths are the kind of badass-type heroes that I can really kind of form a connection with and who I actually like stepping into the shoes of for a while. And uh, one other comes to mind right now, and that is Francis York Morgan of Deadly Premonition. And I won't go into him too much, just so far as to say he is an amazing character, uh, well acted, well written, and uh, if you have not played Deadly Premonition, there is uh, the PS3 Director's Cut going to be coming along and the uh, Xbox 360 version has got to be cheap at this point so I would definitely recommend giving it a go and if you don't intend to play Deadly Premonition I would really wholeheartedly recommend you watch uh, the Let's Play of it by Super Great Friend. Uh, SGF is an amazing LPer, uh, one of my favorites and his Deadly Premonition LP is some of his greatest work so if you have room for a long and thorough LP in your life at this point, absolutely give that one a watch. Let's see, uh, also from the PS2, uh, pretty much the entire casts of Persona 3 and 4, just very well written, localized and acted characters. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not mention my all-time number one most intense uh, game crush, which was Listel, the succubus chick from Langrisser 4. Uh, she's one of your potential uh, romantic targets in that game, and uh, if you follow her uh, romance path, just uh, the way she is curious about humans and comes to understand humanity and uh, you know falls for the protagonist, well, it just kind of melts my heart. And uh, I have a little bit of a thing for monster and demon chicks, so... Uh, you know, bonus. That's about all I can think of offhand, so thank you very much to Crunchy Nougat 81 and we will keep on rolling. And in our continued rollings, we come across Martin Ramsell, who asks, Do you think you will record a special video of some sort for when you hit 2,000 subscribers? It's getting very close, and I imagine your loyal fans and subscribers would be amused by something like that. I know I would be. Well, with my deepest apologies, I think I kind of missed the boat on that one. The 2,000 subscriber mark was reached and passed sometime last month, and at the time of this recording, I am sitting comfortably at 2,038 subscribers. Uh, I don't really have an idea for a commemorative video for that, and again, I really kind of uh, missed the actual occasion, which passed sometime last month. Even the five-year uh, milestone... I'm dragging that way across the deadline by taking this long to get the last of my Q&A stuff up. Uh, but I will say that I am tremendously grateful for the uh, subscribers that I have. I really never imagined I would hit the four-digit mark, let alone the four-digit mark and an additional thousand and change besides. So thank you all very much. Uh, you've been some great commenters among those uh, 2038. And uh, I especially appreciate the uh, kind thoughts and uh, kind words that you've expressed when uh, I've been down or having some rough times. That kind of stuff is especially appreciated and very generous of you. So, uh, in the absence of a 2,000 subscriber video, I'll just say thank you once again. And also from Martin, we have, I also wanted to ask you about the co-op game thing. I'm sure a bunch of subscribers have already said this, but it would be an awesome thing to get to play some game with you co-op or some such. Even outside of recording purposes, it would be an honor of sorts. Well, thank you, I'm very flattered. And uh, as far as co-op LPing, I'm a little hesitant about that most of the time, because unless it's someone I really know well, like Boscoji, for example, uh, we won't necessarily click and uh, unless you've got a good back and forth going with someone it can be kind of a train wreck but uh, you know you catch me on a good day or if you have a good game suggestion or whatever I may well be up for it so you're always welcome to ask or invite 
And uh, outside of recording purposes, I don't do a whole lot of multiplayer. But, uh, you know, if you have a game that I happen to uh, have on the PlayStation 3, uh, you know, if uh, there's something you'd like to co-op or even uh, play uh, competitively, you're always uh, welcome to ask about it. I have played KOF 13 with a couple of uh, my viewers, and I'm really terrible at KOF 13, but a good time was had by all nonetheless, so yeah, you're uh, always welcome to suggest it. I can't do XBL because I don't have a gold account, but uh, yeah. There is also, of course, uh, PC games, although I can't think of any that I play multiplayer right now. But one more time, you're always welcome to ask. I don't mind asking, I just may not have a positive answer for you. Well, thank you very much, Martin, and we will continue onward and try and get this Q&A thing put to bed. A new challenger broke into the finals, and that challenger goes by the name of Elfenrir13, who asks, What are some of your favorite bands? You've mentioned some good old 80s metal a few times in your plays. The Doro reference in Dark Savior was great. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Warlock's Triumph and Agony is, in fact, one of my favorite albums. I wouldn't go so far as to say Warlock is one of my favorite bands, because their earlier work in my book is very hit and miss, but Triumph and Agony was thoroughly awesome, and Doro's following uh, solo career has definitely had its high points as well. And I do like a fair share of good old 80s metal. I have a uh, definite fondness for Sleaze Rock of the Motley Crue type, and I went through a period of very deep adulation toward Faith No More, and there are others that I'm failing to think of at the moment. Uh, as far as more uh, contemporary metal goes, I have a leaning toward the more symphonic or power metal flavors. Uh, I do have an unironic uh, appreciation for Dragon Force, and I liked uh, After Forever quite a bit before they uh, parted ways. On a very old school metal note, I'm quite fond of Girl School, who I can't believe are still touring after 30 years. A lot of classic rock. I uh, love me some Springsteen, old and new. Uh, more contemporarily, and on a completely different stylistic note, I'm very impressed with a lot of what I've heard from Foxy Shazam. But above and beyond all else, my leading musical love, and this is another place where I'm probably going to embarrass myself quite a bit, has got to be Jim Steinman. Scandalous, you say? Who the hell is Jim Steinman? Well, the quick and easy answer is that he's the guy who wrote all of the Meatloaf songs you're actually likely to have heard of. He did write all of the songs on Bad Out of Hell 1 and 2, and contributed a number of songs to the lesser-known Meatloaf albums. Whenever there's uh, spoken word stuff on a Meatloaf album, like Would You Offer Your Throat to the Wolf with the Red Roses, or I Once Killed a Boy with a Fender Guitar, that is in most cases Jim's voice. He's also known for his work with Bonnie Tyler, most notably Total Eclipse of the Heart, and also Holding Out for a Hero. Uh, my personal favorite Steinman songs are the ones he wrote for the beginning and end of the film Streets of Fire, those being uh, Nowhere Fast and Tonight is What It Means to Be Young, performed by Fire Inc., and some other stuff like his solo album Bad for Good, his girl group Pandora's Box, and the musical Tanster Vampire. But long story short, when you hear a really long song with a really long title, a double entendre or two dropped here and there, Themes of teenage romance, uh, big Wagnerian symphonics, and a lot of people going, Aww, in the background. There's a fairly good chance Jimmy had something to do with it. But, yep, even though I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, I am a big old Steinman nerd. Elfenrir 13 also speaks, My top Saturn game was probably the legendary Dragon Force. Have you ever gotten to play this masterpiece? Oh yes, Dragon Force is one of my favorite Saturn games as well. And among the, uh proud few who actually owned the system, it seems to be quite widely beloved. In my book, Dragon Force does have some gameplay issues, uh, most importantly the fact that the AI is dumber than a sack of hammers and will fall for incredibly basic shit over and over again, but really, the enormous cast of characters, the tons of entertaining dialogue and side quests, and just the overall polish and uh, 
charm, really, of the game. Uh, some of its character designs are very appealing. There's just a lot going for it that helps make up for the fact that uh, it's a very simple war game. And, uh, yeah, I have played Dragon Force, and I have very fond memories of it. Gotta play through it again one of these days. At any rate, thank you very much for your questions, Elfenrir13. Alright, our penultimate question comes from the Mangy Kerr. And the Mangy Kerr has a pretty simple question, which is, could you possibly share one or two of your most fondly remembered video game moments? Now, as simple a question as that is, it's actually a really difficult one to answer, because I have several decades of video game memories to choose from, and my memory is rather Civ-like, as I've mentioned earlier in this session. So, most fondly remembered moments... That's a tough one off the top of my head, but I can readily share one of my most vivid and old video game memories, which I hope will uh, be sufficient. And that is that uh, when I was a Sprout, still living in the house where we had the Pong console in the basement, there was a convenience store within walking distance. A convenience store that is still there, I should mention. God, I haven't been there in so many years, I need to stop in one of these days. Anyway, uh, when I had time to kill, I would sometimes walk down to this convenience store, where for a very long time they had a gauntlet machine. And, uh, I was a very square and straight-laced young man, but I was really into gauntlet, so I would go down there and play along with the, uh, basically burnout headbanger crowd that clustered around Gauntlet. And Gauntlet was a fairly metal game, if you think about it. But anyway, as I mentioned, I was a very square child, and probably more than a little obnoxious. But the older headbangers would grudgingly tolerate my presence, and they would let me play whenever I had quarters on hand, possibly out of a shared love of Gauntlet, and I was a decent player. But the uncontested champion of Gauntlet at that location was someone I had only heard of as the Mailman. The older kids would speak of the mailman in reverential terms, and the leading legend about him was that he could suey through 20 boards. Now, what that meant in our uh, regional 80s video game slang was that he could build up enough health uh, just from playing really well at the lower levels that uh, he could go through 20 levels without even trying to fight back. He would just run through every monster, not even try to avoid damage, basically tank everything, and just soak it all up with his enormous pool of hit points. I only ever saw the mailman in person one time. I dimly recall him as being a little on the short side, and a relatively polite and quiet metalhead compared to most of his contemporaries, and he was a hell of a gauntlet player. While I was there, he didn't do anything nearly as dramatic as suing through 20 boards, but I was very impressed with his skills, and was able to believe he could be capable of such an accomplishment. I don't think it was long after that that the convenience store replaced its gauntlet machine. Now, gauntlet was obviously still raking in the quarters, so I kinda wonder if they didn't replace it out of hopes that it would stop a big crowd of noisy headbangers from hanging around their shop all day. If that was the intent, then I have to say it didn't work, they replaced it with a super sprint machine, and all that meant was that they had a bunch of noisy headbangers hanging around the store playing super sprint all day. But as you can probably tell, even decades later this remains a very vivid memory for me. And these days, with more powerful home consoles and internet gaming, arcades have become somewhat obsolete, and to the degree that they still exist at all, they're kind of a retro thing. And there are definitely good things to be said for that, having a more rich home gaming experience. But that kind of arcade culture, where you would have people clustered around the machine of the day, trying to show each other up, and, uh, you know, trading secrets and hidden moves and things like that, that kind of social arcade culture is something that I really miss, and think I always will. My thanks to you, Mangy Kerr, for that little trip down memory lane. 
That brings us to our final question, which comes from Lady of Doom Dragons. And the good lady asks, If you were trapped in a mystic portal between dimensions with ten games and the consoles or PCs to play them, which games would they be? Keep in mind you are trapped forever, and since no time goes by in the void, you live forever. You must keep yourself from being bored until time ends. MMOs are not acceptable answers here. Sorry if this is an annoying question. Well, no, good lady of Doom Dragons, it's not an annoying question, but it is a very difficult one, which is... Really the main reason I saved it for last. Let's give this thing a shot. Now our obvious starting point would be my favorite game of all time, which as I've mentioned is Space Harrier. And now I want Space Harrier, the arcade version, in the deluxe motion cabinet. Because if I'm gonna have to spend all of eternity with these ten games, then goddammit I'm gonna get to choose my version. So whoever's hooking me up with the hardware and the software for this extra dimensional purgatory, you better get me the motion cabinet. <clears throat> Moving onward, there comes the question of whether I can have compilations as long as they're part of the same retail box. If that's the case, then I am going to take the Metal Gear Solid HD collection, but if I can only have one game and it can't be a compilation title, then I would just take MGS3 because Metal Gear is one of my very favorite series, and I don't think it has ever reached greater heights than it did in Snake Eater. After that, we'll take Dark Souls. I'd really kinda hate to lose out on Demon Souls, but I think we only really need one Soul series game. And uh, Dark Souls is the larger game with the bigger world, and I think it would be more replayable. So, we'll stick with Dark Souls. And one of the great masterpieces of the PS2 generation, God Hand, would have to come along with me. So, that gives us four. Where do we go from there? I think then we have to start filling up genres. So, every now and then I do need a good driving game. <clears throat> and very nearly the platonic ideal of the driving genre for me is OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast. I've only ever played the PS2 version. The Xbox version might be better, but since I don't know that personally, I'll go ahead and take the PS2 version. Now we have God Hand, but I'm gonna need to take along a traditional beat-em-up. And on that front, I really don't think the genre has ever reached greater heights than Streets of Rage 2. You would think it would be an arcade game, but Streets of Rage 2 really took the arcade-style brawler gameplay and I think refined it more than it's ever been done elsewhere. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six. Four more to go. Let's see. Uh, we need a platformer. And that comes to a tough call between Super Mario 3 or Super Mario World. I'm gonna go ahead with World because while the case could certainly be made that Super Mario 3 is the overall superior game, I've played it more. Super Mario World I haven't squeezed quite as much life out of just through replaying over and over again. And I think it is a little bit larger, although I couldn't swear to that. So we'll take Super Mario World. And a fighting game would be good, because those are pretty much endlessly replayable. If I can take a compilation, I think I would take the Japan-only Darkstalkers collection. And if I can't take a compilation, then I will go with an arcade cabinet of Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge. I like that a little better than Vampire Savior and although I'm not going to make any claims to them being the best fighting games of all time, I really just like the character design and the overall feel of the Darkstalker series. So that'll be my fighting game. Uh, War Game. I'll take the fan-translated version of Langrisser 4. The Saturn version is a little better, but there's no translation patch for that, so... Yeah, I'm gonna have to take the PS version just because it's in English, even if it's not as good. 
and if I've been counting correctly, that will bring me up to nine. Tenth game, that's really tough. Well, I don't have an RPG on the list, and there's no RPG that has ever made me quite as happy as Persona 4, so yeah, Persona 4 it is. Wow, I'm really losing out on a lot of games here. They're ones that I would really, really be upset to leave behind for all eternity, like the Dead Rising series, a couple of the Sonic games, stuff like that, but if I only get 10 to keep me busy for all time, then I think those are going to be the ones. Of course, if you ask me on a different day, I might have different answers, but in the here and now, that's my 10. Thank you very much, Lady of Doom Dragons. And that, dear friends, is all of them. So I would also like to extend a big thank you to everyone who has submitted questions, and to everyone who has watched, subscribed, commented, offered advice or encouragement, or otherwise participated in the I Played a Thing experience for the last five years. It has been a hell of an enjoyable half decade, certainly for me to produce, and hopefully for you to consume as well. And as I wrap up this recording here in Eastern U.S. time, we are inching ever closer to the end of 2012, so I wish you all a very happy new year. I hope you'll be ringing in that shit like a rock star, or a porn star, or if you're more like me, a Doritos and Strawberry Crush at home star. Whatever makes you happy. In any case, if the fates allow, I'll be seeing you a little ways into 2013 playing a brand new thing. And in the meantime, I leave you with the timeless words of a wise old duck who said, There really is more important treasure than this. That is, dream and friends. Take care, everyone.